Good afternoon. On behalf of the Historical Society of Harford County, welcome to this afternoon's presentation, Perfectly Delightful, The Life and Gardens of Harvey Ledoux. I'm Jackie Seneschal, your host for this brown bag lunch. Our conversation today tells the life and legacy of a favorite figure of New York and Harford County society, Harvey Ledoux. His is a story of industrial age wealth and a life lived to the fullest. We'll learn about his life from his boyhood in New York City to his years on Long Island through his final years here in Harford County. Our guest today is Mariana Skaronsky, the director of the Historical Society of Harford County. Her extensive knowledge of Harvey Ledoux and his life is a product of her two decades of work for the Historical Society and the interests she shares with Harvey, fox hunting, polo, and horses. Some of our viewers may know little about this character whose name is associated with Ledoux Gardens, which is at 3535 Jarrettsville Pike. The Garden Society of America has characterized these gardens as one of the 10 incredible topiary gardens around the world. The late Christopher Weeks, author and local historian writes, the enchanting world that is Pleasant Valley, 22 landscaped acres divided into 15 garden rooms, contains a diversity that would be hard to credit to anyone but Harvey Ledoux, a rare and unusual man who embraced a seemingly impossible breadth of diverse interests. This living work of art becomes playful where the fountains splash, grows stately where the alleys sweep into the dark grandeur of the surrounding forests, and relaxes into simplicity where the wildflower filled meadow drifts down from the rear of the house. It has a place for every mood and leaves the visitor with the enduring impression of its maker's serenity, sophistication, and wit. Today's event is a rebroadcast of a program originally aired on the Harford Cable Network, followed by a live conversation with Mariana. The original broadcast was hosted by our friend and former Historical Society president, President Joe Swisher, and it first aired in November of 2015. During the broadcast, you can submit your questions for our guest using the Q&A feature of Zoom or through the comment section. Welcome to Historic Harford. I'm Joe Swisher, your host. Today, our guest is Mariana Skaronsky who is the executive director of the Historical Society of Harford County. Our topic today is Harvey Ledoux and his topiary gardens. Welcome, Mariana. Hi, Joe. Thanks for having me back. Well, Mariana, who was Harvey Ledoux? Let's start at the beginning. Well, if we start at the beginning, uh, Harvey Ledoux was born in New York City in 1887. He was the son of a wealthy New York industrialist. Uh, here we see a picture of Harvey as a, as a youth. Uh, his family raised him in, in New York along with his sister Elise. Uh, this image that we see here is um, a sample of a typical New York brownstone um, and very similar to the one that the Ledoux family had while they were in New York. Um, the family business was, as I said, industrial leather belting. Um, both families were of means, both Harvey's mother and father. This is a scene of New York City with St. Patrick's Cathedral in the background. And in the foreground, you can see one carriage with a gray horse, and that was the Ledoux family carriage. Uh, they were very um, much into horses um, d during that time period. Uh, this image is actually from an antique postcard. I believe this is in the collection of Ledoux Gardens, and this shows an overview of the family's um, industrial factory. And this factory is no longer in existence, I assume? No longer in existence. Um, as much of Long Island was developed over the years, and quite a few things went by the wayside, and the factory is one of them. Well, I understand he had an Uncle Joe. What's that all about? Well, Uncle Joe was Harvey's uncle, his father's brother. Um, they ran the business together. The business had actually been started by their father, 
um, and taken over by the sons. Uncle Joe was probably not quite as interested in the business as his brother Edward was, um, who was Harvey's father. Uh, he really was more of a sportsman and somewhat of a playboy. His passion in life was yachting and he owned um, several boats over the course of his life. Um, one in particular um, played into Harvey and his sister's lives. Um, after their parents had died, um, Uncle Joe basically took them um, on what was to have been an around the world cruise. Uh, this was in 1913. Of course, World War I was in the offing and uh, they actually got to Japan where the boat was seized by the Japanese government along with um, the crew of 30, so you can know what size um, boat vessel we're talking about, um, and everybody was put off the boat and uh, it was confiscated, so that ended the cruise. Well, Mariana, who else was in the family with Harvey? Well, Joe, Harvey only had one sibling, and that was his sister Elise, who we see here in this image um, in a typical Gibson girl um, outfit of, of the day. They were very close throughout their entire lives. Um, but they were also greatly influenced by their, particularly their grandmother Walls, uh, their mother's mother. She has been described as um, very socially outgoing, um, very fun, uh, very much into the arts and, and culture. Uh, their grandmother Ledoux was somewhat the opposite. Um, she's been described, as has the Ledoux family, as um, much more serious and, and business minded. Um, but the Growing up as he did, especially with his grandmother Walls as um, his influence, really gave him his introduction to art and culture, which would become very important to him later in his life. And both grandparents, as I understand it, were very wealthy. Is that true? They were a product of their time. I mean, he was fortunate enough to be brought up in a upper class family. Um, they, they were members of um, the class that was known as the Gilded Age. Um, and they, they did have means um, which afforded Harvey a very nice life throughout his lifetime um, up until his old age. Well, Harvey then grew up in New York, is that correct? Harvey, did, Harvey and his sister did grow up in New York, and they were in Manhattan for the early part of their lives. And then the family purchased um, a home out on Long Island, um, Glen Cove. The house was called Elsinore, which we see in this image. Um, and it's very obvious that it was a typical high Victorian with a lot of gingerbread. Um, in his writings, Harvey claimed that he was never that particularly fond of the house itself. Um, it didn't agree with his taste. Um, it, he was actually quoted as saying that the only thing to improve it would be to burn it down and build it again. Um, he, as a youth, um, was given riding lessons by his parents. Ironically, they didn't want him to do any jumping because they felt it was too dangerous. But later in his life, after their death, uh, as an adult, he learned to jump and became quite a horseman, um, an avid fox hunter. He also had horses in New York, is that correct? Well, the family um, maintained a stable when they were still living in New York City, and that uh, mainly was to house carriage horses. Um, his mother was quite an equestrian. She did ride, um, and she was what is known as, as a good hand with a whip. Uh, she um, had taken carriage driving lessons and drove a four in hand as well as tandem. Um, and so they, they did maintain a large stable with quite a few different um, horse-drawn vehicles. And didn't he take some courses while he was in New York? That's when um, he really um, became interested in art and fine arts. And he did study art, uh, drawing and painting um, as a youth. And that was something that um, became main, was an interest throughout his entire life, uh, were the arts. And with that came dinner parties. Dinner parties, yes. And opera. Um, he was also very interested in opera and the theater. Again, an interest that um, he maintained throughout his life. Well, during World War I, Harvey was in the Army, is that correct? He was. Um, at the time the United States entered the war, he had actually been in Spain with um, his uncle and aunt, and he felt it was his duty to return home and enlist, which he did. Um, I think he had visions of um, somewhat more of a glamorous career than it turned out. Um, he went in and actually wound up becoming ill and spent most of the war in recovery. But he did act as a translator. Um, he spoke fluent French and um, spent his time um, basically as a translator. Uh, he, I don't think he ever really saw action. 
Well, after the war, he traveled a good bit, is that correct? He did. Uh, he was a relatively young man and had the means to do so. Uh, one of his trips was taken on the Trans-Siberian Railroad. Uh, at another time, he found himself in the Middle East um, and actually made the acquaintance of a gentleman that some of our viewers may recognize, T.E. Lawrence, um, at, or better known as Lawrence of Arabia. Uh, they made it maintained a friendship until uh, Lawrence's um, death. Um, he, he also became friends with Edward, who was then Prince of Wales, and later um, infamously would marry Wallace Warfield, a Baltimore uh, woman, um, and give up the throne of England uh, to his brother. Now, I understand he never married and he never had children, is that correct? That's right. He was a bachelor all of his life, um, but he was very close to his nieces and nephews. Uh, one niece in particular, Patricia Corey, uh, he was particularly close to, and we do see lots of correspondence between them. Um, but he, he corresponded with his sister quite often, and in that correspondence we also see many mentions of, of the nieces and nephews. And I understand he also played polo. Is that right? He played a little bit of polo. Um, he, again, was friends with a um, group of people, uh, his contemporaries, such as the Guests and the Phipps um, and many other uh, New Yorkers. Um, polo was an incredibly popular sport in the time period in their social class, so he, w he was around polo a lot. Well, in the 1920s, Harvey bought a farm in Harford County. How about uh, telling us about where it's at and what it's all about? Well, if anybody's driven down the Jarrettsville Pike uh, near Pocock Road, you'll see a large wooden fence um, that runs along the road, and that is Ledoux Gardens. Uh, it was originally a dairy farm. Um, you can see it highlighted on this map um, and, and truly was a, a, a working farm at the time Harvey bought it. Um, he would eventually turn it into the showpiece that it is. Uh, during his early tenure there, he actually built a race course, which we see an image of. And in the far background, you see the house um, up on the hillside. And I think we have a better image of the house. Um, this is a period a photograph of the house taken from the race course looking up at it. Um, so you're in, in this um, image, you're actually on Falston Road looking up towards Jarrettsville Pike. After he bought it, he expanded the house, didn't he? He did. He really, um, as I said, it was a working farm um, and he really wanted to make it um, more comfortable and more what he was used to. Uh, here we see a much more recent um, photograph of it where it's landscaped, painted um, and added on to. Well, we have a map here. How about the, our aerial photograph? How about explaining that? Well, the aerial photograph, um, probably the focal point is the blue dot in the center, and that is the swimming pool. Uh, Harvey put an in the ground swimming pool in, which is now a centerpiece of what they call the Great Bowl, where uh, Ledoux holds concerts every year. Uh, you could see the house to the viewer's right, and the rest of the property uh, to the left of the viewer's left. Uh, is some farmland, the gardens, um, and other acreage, which we'll look at a little bit more. Well, this is basically just Ledoux Topiary Garden. The next picture kind of shows all the land he owned. Yes, this um, photo, you'll see two arrows, and the red arrow um, pointing to a dark circle, that is actually an old uh, quarry. Uh, it's now filled in and filled with water. The yellow arrow points to one of the two polo fields of the Maryland Polo Club, uh, which uh, leases land from Ledoux um, and holds polo matches there uh, throughout the summer. And finally? The real reason that Harvey came down to Maryland was to fox hunt. And we al I always say that if it weren't for fox hunting, there would be no Ledoux Gardens. Uh, this is a photo probably taken in the late 50s or early 60s. Uh, the hunt is um, having met at Harvey's Pleasant Valley home and getting ready to start off for the day. Well, let's take a walk through the gardens themselves now. We have a few pictures uh, to introduce the gardens and the, at the entrance. Okay. Well, this photograph, anybody who has been to Ledoux Gardens will recognize this scene immediately. Uh, this is the famous Tobiary Hunt scene, which actually had its beginnings in New York and was brought down to Maryland by Harvey. Um, it's changed in uh, its uh, design a little bit over the years. Um, the uh, topiary pieces have um, grown out and other, um, other pieces have been added to the overall scene. Uh, here we've got a uh, hunter following the hounds uh, coming directly at the viewer 
in this picture jumping a white fence. Uh, this is a slightly different angle showing the same scene with the huntsman following hounds. Well, they have to keep these trimmed all the time, don't they? They do. I'm glad it's not my job. Uh, this is a, an other piece, uh, another fox hunter uh, sort of coming out of a corner. A lot of people overlook this one because it's a little bit out of the way. Uh, and then here we have the fox himself. Uh, this would be the first piece that um, you would see uh, with everybody following along behind him. The gift shop has been converted um, from one of the outbuildings on the property um, and it's open uh, whenever the gardens are open um, and you can find wonderful uh, items to do with gardening and hunting and foxes and what have you. And that's where you get your tickets to view purchase, the gardens. Purchase tickets, yes, yes. It's a good starting point for the tours of the, of the property. Very good. Well, now that we've got a ticket to enter the gardens and the house, let's start with the house and kind of tell what you're going to see when you go in it. Well, Joe, when you um, enter the house, um, it's almost impossible to see everything, so I do recommend return visits. Um, but this image um, is a black and white photo of the parlor, which has recently been redone. Um, the committees at Ledoux um, took it back a little bit more to its original design. Uh, the house, as I said, is just filled with so many objects. This is a beautiful ornate mirror and it's just a sample of, of some of um, the antiques that you'll see as, as you tour the house. Uh, this is a close-up of a, a china cupboard or break front uh, in the parlor and uh, it's not quite visible here but when you see it in person it's filled with all sorts of um, English china pieces, um, all different fox hounds, um, hunting hounds and foxes and pieces like that. This is the dining room, one of my favorite rooms in the house. Um, it is actually done with a very heavy influence on fox hunting um, as are most of the rooms in the house. Um, we move upstairs to Harvey's bedroom. Uh, this is a detail of a little breakfast tray uh, set up uh, with a chocolate and coffee service. Uh, if you look closely, you'll again see foxes, little, little foxes on the handles of the chocolate pot. Now we come to what is probably the most famous room um, in the house. This is the uh, Oval Library. Um, the books in the cases were actually brought down on a truck from New York, unloaded and put into the cases. And as we'll see in the next image, there's a little bit of a secret, and that is actually a secret passageway. Um, the story goes that Harvey wanted a way to escape um, if somebody was in the house that he didn't particularly want to deal with at that moment in time. Um, the, how, the room is so famous, it's been described as one of the most beautiful rooms um, in America in, in a preserved house and we actually um, have at the Historical Society a miniature of the room that was created down to exact detail showing the room itself and the hallway um, where Harvey would keep his riding things um, and he would leave that doorway and his horse would be brought to him and he would get on his horse just outside of the, that hallway and room. And that's a beautiful little model. That's about two feet by two feet, is that it? Yes, it actually um, was loaned to the Society by Sharon May, who is the owner of it. Well, Mariana, now we have several pictures of the topiary gardens. Uh, let's go through them and kind of explain what they are. Okay, well, we might need another episode to go through the entire gardens, but um, here we see uh, the beginnings of the gardens, a uh, black and white photo from back in the day. This is what's now the Great Bowl. And I think our next shot, we're going to see what it looks like today. Uh, so here we see the topiary is fully formed. And what was the old swimming pool is now the centerpiece for that lawn. Um, another example of topiary with a little sort of peek through window. Uh, again, cut by Harvey originally and, and maintained by him. And now, of course, uh, a large, large staff of um, gardeners at Ledoux maintains all of this. Yeah, and it takes a lot it of takes maintaining. A lot. It does. This is a beautiful um, aerial shot of the gardens. Uh, we can see, again, the swimming pool, the topiary, um, and in the background, uh, the formal gardens. Along with the fox hunt scene, probably Ledoux's other signature image is the swan hedge. Uh, again, created by Harvey and, as we'll see, actually maintained um, by him. As you can see, he, he really was hands-on um, as long as his health allowed him to. 
he was out in the garden uh, cutting, creating, um, and designing and, and working on, in the gardens. Here we see uh, the Swan Hedge as, as it looks today, uh, much, much more um, mature and, and grown out than um, 40 years ago. This is the sculpture garden, um, always reminds me of a, a chessboard. Um, as you wander through, you'll find all types of um, topiary. Uh, there's a tribute to Winston Churchill. Uh, you'll see various birds um, as well as architectural features. Um, and nods to modern art as well. In spring, the place really pops open. Spring is really um, when it's at, at its, its peak, I, I think, although there are wonderful things to see year-round. Um, but a great thing about the property is not only do you have the sweeping vistas of Topiary, you have little hidden nooks as well, as, as, as seen here. Um, back to the Topiary, uh, this is a peacock with a lot of annuals in the foreground. Many um, alleys throughout the, the property, um, long pathways that will lead you from one quote unquote room to the next. Um, and, and as with the house, it's almost too much to take in in one, in one visit. This is one of my favorites. Uh, this is the Rose Garden, um, designed by Harvey. Um, over the years, um, the species um, or types have changed. Um, to ones that are a little bit more resistant um, to um, sickness and drought. Uh, the iris garden has changed somewhat. Um, during Harvey's time, it was much more extensive um, and had bearded iris. Uh, it's been changed over the years to Siberian iris. Um, and you can see here, almost like a waterway with the purple color. This is the famous tea house. Um, if you open the door and go on through, you'll actually see uh, basically a picture frame. Um, there's no painting in it because the painting is the view throughout the window. Um, and so it was an ever-changing painting. Do they ever serve tea in it? You know, I don't know. I don't know if they do. <laughs> uh, this is a, a little stream, sort of a tiered stream. Um, the gardens have many natural features, um, some created to be natural, some natural themselves. Um, uh, these are the beehives. Uh, you can see the straw hives uh, sitting on the stone wall uh, below the large one on the post um, in, in a wooded area. Uh, I believe this is the rose garden again um, from the outside. You can see the brick uh, wall that surrounds uh, with a brick archway um, and again some of the lawn and woods in the background. This is uh, sort of a, um, what was known as a folly. Uh, it's a, a copy of a Greek temple. It was quite the fashion in England in the uh, 17 and 1800s to recreate Greek ruins. Um, and Harvey was um, particularly keen on garden sculpture and um, he had quite a sense of humor as is evident in this photograph of him mimicking one of his own garden statues. Well, after going through the house and the gardens, it's time for some refreshments. How about uh, telling us about that? Well, looking at this photograph, uh, which is a picture of the barns um, during a snowstorm probably back in the 1930s, it's hard to believe that what we're going to see next um, exists. And this is the same building, uh, the stable and um, carriage house and it has been converted into um, sort of a little social center, a uh, place where you can have lunch. Uh, the property is rented out on an occasion for weddings. Um, upstairs um, is what was Harvey's old studio um, and small library. Uh, this is a period picture showing how it was furnished and decorated during his lifetime. This is a photo uh, by Aubrey Bodine, I believe taken for uh, the newspaper, and uh, it's Harvey posing in front of one of his paintings. Um, as I had said earlier, uh, he maintained his love of art throughout his life and, and painted throughout his life. And finally? So now we go downstairs. Uh, this was the stable area. This housed all of Harvey's hunters. Um, the stalls um, you can see with the white doors and the cast iron uh, grills. And each stall still bears the nameplate of the horse uh, who was housed there. And it's now the cafeteria. Well, Harvey Ledoux died in 1976 at the age of 89. 
uh, we have a few pictures here to commemorate him. Mm -hmm. Harvey was so popular. Uh, he, he just had friends all over the world. Um, he uh, was featured quite a few times in both local and national publications. Uh, here we see um, a story that the Baltimore Sun had done on him, um, and we see him dressed in his um, Masters of Foxhounds um, tog. Uh, here we see Harvey as a much younger man, um, very reminiscent of William Powell, I always thought. Uh, this painting hangs in the house itself, and we see Harvey in his hunting clothes uh, with some of his memorabilia around him. In the 1990s, uh, the late Christopher Weeks uh, took it upon himself to write a biography of, of Harvey and his life. And the book is, um, I think, published by Johns Hopkins. It's still available and can be purchased um, for those who really want to delve more in, into his life. It's very fascinating and just not enough time to talk about in one half hour show. Um, so Joe, I really hope that um, anybody who sees this program uh, will be inspired to go and visit Ledoux. Uh, it's open um, the large portion of the year. They will close down in the winter um, for the holidays. Um, but it's, it's a wonderful place and um, something that you should go see many, many times. Well, I certainly enjoyed visiting it, and I enjoyed doing the show with you, Mariana. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. And a special thanks to you, our viewing audience, for being with us today on Historic Hartford. Well... That was certainly a lot of material about Harvey Ledoux and his gardens. Um, I do want to remind our audience uh, that you can submit a question for Mariana to answer <clears throat> using either the Q&A function or the comment function um, there on your, or the chat function rather, at the bottom of your screen. But in the meantime, Mariana, how did you become interested in Harvey Ledoux? You were in high school when he died in 1976. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have occasion to meet him? <laughs> um, unfortunately, I did not have occasion to meet Harvey. Um, I have been interested in horses literally my entire life. And I was very fortunate that um, uh, when I was in the first grade, um, I met my lifelong friend, Bonnie Six. Um, her grandfather, Bob Six, Robert Six, uh, actually worked for Harvey as his hunt groom for 10 years. Um, so I basically, um, from being around the family, uh, grew up hearing um, the stories of, of Harvey. Um, later on, I uh, hunted with Elkridge Harford um, Hunt. Uh, for 21 years I spent uh, there. And of course, Harvey, Harvey's home is right next door to the hunt club. Um, so I ridden um, and hunted through his property and uh, just over the years, it, I just really became interested and fascinated with him and um, have read about him and researched and collected um, materials about him over the years. And, and that's kind of how it all got started. Can you tell us a little bit of the stories that you learned uh, from your friends? Sure. Um, well, um, first thing I have to say is that it's impossible to talk about Harvey's entire life in this short period of time. Um, the man was just um, amazing. Um, I, I think they broke the mold. Um, but um, he came down here in the 20s originally with friends from New York to hunt and fell in love with the place, as did many, many people um, during that time period. So in 1929, he bought um, what was the Scar Farm, um, and which is now the Dutopiary Gardens. Um, but over the years, uh, listening to um, Bob and some other people talk about him, um, you, you came to realize just sort of what a uh, Renaissance man he was. Um, as, as you saw in the video, uh, he, he had a wide variety of interests. Um, he, kept, he loved black and white. Um, for, for that was his, sort of his color scheme and down to the fact that all of the livestock on the farm were black and white. Uh, when you visit, you'll see a lot of um, bird houses and those houses are actually um, were homes for pigeons and the pigeons were black and white. Um, he, he raised hogs at a certain por um, portion of time. The hogs were black and white. Um, one of the comments that um, Bob Six made was that uh, he would have had black and white felted cattle, but they were too expensive, which is 
kind of amusing when you look at the lifestyle that he was living that he thought the cattle were too expensive. Um, but he did have Angus cattle that he kept on the, on the property. Um, he was a great uh, party giver and party goer. Uh, during uh, prohibition, when alcohol was outlawed uh, and anybody that was drinking alcohol was generally drinking bootleg. Uh, well, that wasn't really quite good enough for Harvey. So he would have um, four roses uh, brought down somehow from Canada. So there was no bootleg at, at Harvey's parties. Um, he and, and the parties were um, pretty fabulous um, from what we can tell. I've seen some scrapbooks um, that have belonged to uh, different friends and the invitations would go out and generally Harvey would draw a lot of the invitations himself. And, and I've seen some of them and they really were quite amusing, a uh, little, little cartoons. Um, some of them maybe not politically correct in this day and age. Um, but he was also covered the local newspapers, particularly, particularly the Aegis. Um, it had a sort of society, social neighborhood section and uh, Harvey's parties were mentioned. Um, I found clippings where the parties were mentioned and who attended and what the theme was. Um, uh, I think one was um, an oriental, uh, like Arabian Nights theme. Um, there were so, and, and there were many, many others. Um, but um, some of the some of the other things that were interesting um, uh, were uh, his in his travels. Um, one um, event that he or took place, uh, which was very unusual for the time, was he fox hunted in Harford County on a Saturday, drove to New York or took the train. I'm not sure, um, but he got up to New York got on a, on a plane, one of the clipper planes, flew to France, and from there went to England and was basically fox hunting in England 24 hours later. Um, so uh, he, he just basically, if he wanted to do it, he did it. Um, his family's business was sold um, at a certain point in time, and the funds that he lived on, I think, really were from the sale of the business. Um, and he's quoted in some of his writings as saying that um, he was going to spend his youth enjoying uh, life and his means. And then when he turned about 50 years of age, that's when he thought he would sit down and get serious and work in an office. Um, but he actually wound up not doing that and pretty much spent his entire life just enjoying his means. Um, some of the other things that he did were... Um, and which I think I touched on briefly was uh, his relationship with um, the Prince of Wales and um, Mrs. Simpson. Um, he originally met um, the Duke um, in New York, in Long Island um, in 1924, I believe it was. Uh, the, he was staying as, as a guest of one of Harvey's friends. Um, of course, all kinds of social things were planned. Um, he was playing polo and the polo match um, coincidentally happened to take place at the um, home of Harvey's um, sister and brother-in-law of the Graces. And so the Prince was playing uh, polo there uh, he decided that he would like to go fox hunting while he was visiting the States. Uh, so a friend of Harvey's asked if he would um, provide him with a horse. Um, Harvey loaned uh, his hunter to him. It was a horse called the Ghost. Um, and he was a little bit leery because apparently the horse was very um, difficult to handle. So he was concerned that um, at that time he was still Prince of Wales. Mrs. Simpson had not come into the picture. And um, Harvey states that he was very worried that um, this horse might actually take out the heir to the throne. Uh, so the whole time the prince was hunting him, Harvey was apparently on tenor hooks, but it all turned out okay. And uh, the prince actually loved the horse. Um, and then sometime later, um, Harvey received an offer that he couldn't refuse um, from someone to purchase the horse which he did sell him. And then uh, when the prince found out that the horse had been sold, he said that Harvey should give him um, a commission on the sale. Um, and later in time, uh, Mrs. Simpson came into the picture, Wallace Warfield, whom coincidentally, um, her, the Warfield family owned a property on Jarrettsville Pike. Um, so they were pretty much neighbors um, of Harvey's property. Um, but he became friends with 
both of them over the years, spent much time with them, um, and considered Wallace actually um, a lovely woman, which contradicts a lot of what people have said about her over the years. Um, so those are just some of the things that you know I've heard heard over time. Sorry, we do have a couple of questions. Do you know where Harvey okay. Ledoux is buried? You know, I, I actually, I'm not sure. I believe he's buried at St. James in Moncton, but um, don't quote me on that because it's actually not something I've ever thought to um, ask. But I, I think he's buried at St. James, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Okay, uh, another question we have is, do you know when the gardens were open to the public? It's not... It's not clear to me, and I'm sure somebody at Ledoux will be able to tell me the answer to that. He writes um, in 1960, around 1967, um, there's a letter um, written to his sister where he talks about 2,000 people having gone through the house. Um, I think that the gardens themselves were set up um, in, in the early 70s, um, but... I, I'm, I'm not honestly not sure about that. I, 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 I share your confusion. I think it was 1971 or 72 that they yeah. set up Ledoux Gardens and that organization opened the gardens to the public. But I've also seen reference to the correspondence you talk about. So, and I remember yeah. my own father talking about the gardens being open on certain days of the year that people could go visit. Um, and that conversation right. and, and, and that would, would have taken place like in the late six, late sixties. Yes, and and that would make sense because um, many, um, not just locally, but um, of people of that sort of time period, um, many estates were open to the public. Um, they, they, in, even in England, there were public, what they literally called them public days where um, people would open up their estates for tourists to come through and, and see them. So it does, it does make sense that that would, would have been the case. Okay, another question that we have is, do you know where Harvey Ledoux's papers and correspondence are stored these days? The majority of them are, um, at Ledoux, um, they uh, have a great archive of material. Um, I was fortunate um, when I did that video um, to, to um, have been given access to it. Um, uh, I was helped by Fran Scully who was working um, there partly as an archivist. Um, so they have a huge collection of Harvey's papers, writings, artwork um, and things. So we're really lucky um, that, it's, that it's all been preserved. And another question, um, and, and you answer, you started to answer this question, but can you talk a little bit more about how Harvey interacted with, with sort of the general Harford County folks? What connections did he have inside the county beyond his activity uh, in the Harford Hunt Club? Um, you know, he had a lot of friends. Um, the, when the garden started, um, most of the people who um, were on the board of directors at that time um, were residents of either Hartford County or um, Baltimore County. Uh, Ledoux is in a, it's in an odd situation because it's literally right on, almost right on the Hartford Baltimore line. So many of his friends were from the My Lady's Manor area um, or Falston. Um, but, um, you, you know, he had, <laughs> He had servants that worked for him in the early days. I, th I think towards the latter years of his life, um, his, he really didn't have the staff that he had um, back in the day. But honestly, I, I think a lot of um, his, the, what we would consider day-to-day -day activities, you know, shopping or what have you, it, he had people to do that for him. Um, <laughs> um, but um, he, he um, he just had such a great sense of humor. Um, if if you read if you really read his writings and if you have access to some of his correspondence, he was a very witty man. Um, I you know I think he must have been a very charming man. Um, obviously, he was um, well read. Uh, he talks about not having been. A stellar scholar. Um, he, he makes references to the fact that a lot of his schooling was interrupted because his family traveled. 
Um, but I, I think he said he felt that he got a better education um, by essentially seeing the world than, than probably he would have had he been in a boarding school somewhere. Um, he spoke, you know, multiple languages, French, German, um, and as I said, he traveled all over the world, uh, makes reference to visits to Greece. Um, there, we mentioned T.E. Lawrence, and um, if anybody's interested, you can probably find this book on um, online at, at a, in a used book site. Um, but there was a book called By Camel and Car to the Peacock Throne, and it's written by Major Alexander Powell. And that is who um, Harvey went on uh, this trip to the Middle East, um, and they referred to Persia, which actually was is now Iran. Um, we have a copy of it here at the Historical Society in our library, but it's a very interesting book. And so I would recommend that um, people might want to um, check that out if, if, if you are interested. Um, another little sidelight, and I had forgotten this story and Jackie had actually mentioned it to me, um, was about a mouse that is named after Harvey. And one of his trips was an expedition to South America that was done for the um, American Museum of Natural History. And he was in Bolivia and the naturalist that was on the trip, apparently uh, mice and rodents were his field of um, expertise. Uh, and so high in the Andes Mountains, he just, this, this naturalist discovered a species of, of rodent that had never been known. And it's actually wound up being named after Harvey Ledoux. Um, and it's called, if I get this right, Thomas Somis Ledui. Um, so um, he, has, he has that to his credit as well. Um, okay, uh, we do have an answer from one of our listeners, Betsy. Betsy says, oh, Betsy. <laughs> Yes, Bessie says, uh, 2021 is the 50th anniversary of the Ledoux Foundation, and that the gardens okay. were open some while Harvey was still living, and they fully opened in 1978, which would be two years after he died. Um, so it sounds like they were, he began to open them sometime in the 60s, set up the yes. foundation to plan for their continuation after he died but then the grounds weren't fully opened until after he That's had passed that makes sense. Yep. then that as, makes as we surmise. yes it makes that makes perfect sense um now one of the photos that we see often is of harvey dressed as master of the fact foxhounds um i mm -hmm. will confess that i don't know very much about fox hunting um, so what's the role of the Master of the Hounds? What did it mean that Harvey was Master of the Hounds of the Harford Hunt Club? Um, it, it can mean different things depending on um, the different hunts. Um, some Masters of Foxhounds are very, very involved in the day-to-day -day operations of, of the hunt itself. Um, Harf when Harvey came down here, uh, it was actually the Harford hunt. It, um, it had not yet joined with the um, Elkridge hunt to become the, what we know now today as the Elkridge Harford hunt. Um, and there was a woman by the name of um, Florence Lowe. She was also a master of foxhounds. And you can't have more than one master of foxhounds at a time. Um, they, they're called joint masters. Um, but she and she was a person who was very very involved with breeding the hounds and bringing hounds in from uh, you know britain things like that harvey uh was master um but i think more from a social point of view i mean he loved to hunt um he uh, brought people down um and generally the master has deep pockets shall we say um so i think his involvement really was more in helping to um fund the operations and to sort of act as social director. Um, I mean, he did hunt, he, he, he did hunt, um, but um, he was not as involved. Um, in fact, um, when uh, a few, when Christopher Weeks was researching this book, um, I went to Ledoux with Chris and with Bob Six and with um, Harriet Iglehart. Uh, whose husband had been Master of Foxhounds. And uh, one of the things that Bob had told us was that basically he never went to the kennels. So um, I think he liked hunting. Um, he liked the social aspect of it, but he wasn't the type of master that was gonna go in the kennels and ask the huntsman, you know, what um, bitch was being bred to what dog and how many puppies were there and, and such. Um, 
Uh, so hopefully that answers your question. Okay. Um, Carol Dybel has said that she thinks that Winston Churchill may have visited at Ledoux. Do you know anything about that? There, not Ledoux. There, there is a legend and um, I've researched and we've tried to find it. The, the story is that um, um, Alfred Smithick was huntsman at the um, Hartford Hunt and he uh, was friends with Winston Churchill in Ireland um, before coming over here. And there has always been a story that at some point in his life, um, Sir Winston and Lady Churchill came and had either lunch or tea on the front lawn of the Hunt Club, which is directly next door to Ledoux. Um, unfortunately, uh, and I do know the Smithwick family, and unfortunately, nobody kept a diary. Um, if it happened, it, it happened sort of under the radar and wasn't uh, reported on in any of the social columns. So we're still looking. I'd like to believe that it's true, but um, we, we just don't know for sure. But it, but it makes a nice story. Um, so, uh. Okay. Um. Harvey had a really wide range of interests. He loved to travel, fox hunting, horses, polo, science, gardening, painting. How would Harvey describe himself? If he, if we met him today, what would Harvey say he did? You know, I, 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 I have thought about that. And I think we have labeled him, um, I mean, I, I know I have referred to him um, over time as a Renaissance man. Um, I've made reference to him as a bon vivant. Um, possibly some might refer to him as a man about town. I'm not sure that Harvey, Harvey would label himself. I think Harvey just was living his life. Um, I, I, I don't know that he would um, have labeled himself. You know, as you said, he, he was all of those things and more. Um, and I, I think maybe he would have said he was a good friend um, because he, he had so many friends literally around the world. Um, but but I, don't, I don't know that he would have ever pigeon, pigeonholed himself. I mean, maybe if he thought about it, uh, you know, maybe he would call himself a Renaissance man, but uh, truly I think Harvey just was living his life and I don't know that he would have um, categorized himself in any particular manner. Um, you shared with me in a previous conversation, a story about mm -hmm. Harvey on a hunt. Uh, so yeah. why don't you share that with everybody? That was fun. Okay, so this is this is a legend that is actually true, um, and I don't know the year that this happened, but uh, the they were out hunting, and um, back in the day, um, the bits that are that are used in in a horse's bridle, um, they were made of steel, um, but it wasn't stainless steel, and um, so I think that the stress level of of them maybe they were more fractured than they are today. But apparently they were hunting and Harvey was galloping along when the bit in his horse's mouth snapped in two. Um, so when that happens like this, you literally have no control over the horse other than the, the nose band, which would go across the, the bridge of the horse's nose. So the story goes that this happened and that the horse um, basically decided it had had enough for the day and galloped um, several miles um, down the road home with Harvey and took him, took him back to Pleasant Valley. Um, so we know the story is true. Um, then um, some years ago, um, and she's now passed away, but um, a lady by the name of Polly Riggs, um, who was an avid fox hunter and treasurer and bookkeeper for the hunt club for decades. I, I was talking with her and I asked her about the story and um, she sort of took the wind out of the sails of the story a little bit because she said, well, frankly, he wasn't that good of a rider and the horse really wasn't going that fast. So it happened, but it wasn't as glamorous or as exciting as everybody says. So, you know, there's two different versions of it, but um, it is a true story. And coincidentally, uh, many years later, uh, the Green Spring Valley Hounds were visiting and hunting with us. And um, Ned Halley, who was one of their joint masters of foxhounds, actually had that happen to him. And I witnessed it. Um, they were coming from, 
um, the opposite side of Ledoux um, heading towards the Jarrettsville Pike and he his horse's bit broke and he was this close to bailing when um, because he would have gone into the traffic on Jarrettsville Pike but um, someone managed to stop the horse um, so it, it can happen. Um, of course, we laughed because someone wanted to throw the bit away and he was like, no, I'm taking that home as a souvenir. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Find Harvey's bits at some point as yes, we go through. Yes. Maybe, maybe, the, maybe the ghost of Harvey was looking out for him that day. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, it's about time for us to, to wrap up. Are there any final stories or thoughts about Harvey that you'd like to share with all of us? Um, you know, I, I, I'd like to say, I, excuse me, that I wish I had known him. Um, I think he was um, just a real character and the kind of person that you really don't find um, these days. Um, I do have to correct myself. There was one thing that I said in the video when I was referring to the topiary and I made reference to a peacock and it's actually a lyre bird. So I want to say that because I know the do will correct me on that. Um, um, no, I, I just really, um, I wish people would read about him. Um, I hope that they'll go and visit Ledoux. Um, if they come to the historical society, uh, you know, we do have um, uh, a collection of um, information about him here. Um, if anybody has any other questions, they can certainly um, send me an email at the historical society. And the flip side of that is if anybody has information, we would love to have it here at the Historical Society. So um, if you have any stories or information, um, please let us know. Um, and uh, that's, that's about all I can say today, but I appreciate you know, everybody tuning in and hope you all enjoyed it. Well, thank you very, very much on behalf of our visitors. Um, and to we want to thank also the Harper Cable Network for making, uh, for giving us permission to use their uh, prior broadcast. Um, so I would like to encourage everybody who's listening uh, to make a visit to Ledoux Gardens. Uh, if you've not done it before, you definitely need to go. If you've done it before, it's time to go back again. Uh, treat yourself to a day of wandering through Harvey's world. Um, and while you're there, you can pick up a copy of Chris Week's book that we've been talking about. Um, and you can learn even more about this fascinating man. Uh, for for those of you who are watching, um, I'd like to encourage you to do a couple of other things. Um, I want to let you know that uh, Mariana, in addition to her interest in Harvey, has also um, written a bulletin for the Historical Society on uh, the races at Haverty Grace, the horse races at Haverty Grace, um, and you can get a copy of that from um, our collection. Or if you go to our website, you could also purchase a copy of the Elk Ridge Fox Hunting Club, uh, Elk Ridge Hounds. It's a history of the Elk Ridge Harford Hunt Club, um, available from our website. Um, <clears throat> if you've enjoyed this presentation today, uh, please consider making a donation or joining us at the Historical Society as a member. You can visit our website at www.harfordhistory.org. Um, our next virtual event will be Tuesday, September the 14th at 12.30 p.m. again. Tom Fink, who's the president of the Junius Buddhist Ruth Society and director of Tudor Hall Museum, will talk to us about Junius Brutus Booth, who his arrival in America in 1821, his ascent as America's greatest Shakespearean actor, and the Booth family life on their farm, the 177 acre farm uh, here in Bel Air. Again, this event is free. You can reserve your space by at the on the Historical Society's website. On the website, you'll also find a list of all of our coming events, more about the history of Harford County. And I want to bring to your attention to September 12th, we'll have an afternoon in the park at Harford Glen. It begins at one o'clock. Uh, you register for that through our website. We've arranged for uh, a talk about the ice house there that's been restored, tours of the manor house, and we'll have two archaeologists speaking to us about the archaeological dig underway now at Old Joppa. So thank you and please join us for our future events.